You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 34 of the Common Descent Podcast. Woohoo! Today, we are discussing the subject of ancient DNA. Dino DNA. Not dino DNA, ancient DNA. Oh, oh okay, okay. Which is different, as we will see. <laughs> ancient DNA is the thing, and also the field of study, that examines DNA from dead stuff. Oh. Dead stuff ranging as recent as, you know, museum specimens of things that are a couple decades old to very ancient things. Ancient DNA, paleogenetics has become a really, really important field in paleontology and in investigating the past. And we are going to do a quick overview of sort of what goes into it, how DNA preserves in the first place, how you extract DNA. And what sort of things we can learn from ancient DNA about creatures of the past. This episode has also been requested. It was requested on the survey, which all those requests are anonymous. Whoops. So thank you to that anonymous requester for requesting this. <laughs> Thanks, survey. And also our friend Leah, who will be mentioned again later in this episode. <laughs> but before we get to our main topic, we have a few announcements to make. The first being that we have two new patrons. Not one, but two. On Patreon. Not one, but two. They are Lori Gesh and Cheryl Resnick. Thank you both so much for joining us. Welcome. Thanks. Listeners, we always welcome new patrons to support us on Patreon. We are extremely grateful to those who do. And among the rewards that you can get as a patron, there is the opportunity to have your name shouted out on the podcast. So, yeah, it's, uh, you just thanks. saw a great example. Twice. Yes, you did. <laughs> And this is the first podcast of the month of May, which means it's a great opportunity for us to remind people that Patreon basically pays for the podcast these days. It does. It, it costs us only time now to make this, which is wonderful. Yes, and that extra support is allowing us to investigate new things to do for the podcast, yeah. which is very exciting. Speaking of additional things, by the time this episode comes out, there will be two other things going on. We will have released the episode where we respond to the survey. Mm -hmm. So check that out. It in involves an extensive Q&A session, which is a lot of fun. It was so much fun. And when this episode is aired, there will only be a couple days left in the poll. So if you have an opinion on who is correct in our epic Crocs versus Snakes argument, head on over to social media and let us know. Uh, if you... If you... For whatever reason, if you're busy, we understand you haven't gotten a chance to vote for Crocs yet. You still have a few more days, so get in there. If you're if your plan is to vote for Crocs, don't even just stay home. <laughs> stay home that day. Just take the day off. <laughs> <laughs> also, one last thing, just a quick shout out. If you liked episodes 13 or 14, which both revolved uh, in part around the Gray Fossil site, you would like to know maybe that the Gray Fossil site now has its own podcast. Yes, it does. It's called A Touch of Grey, and it's a lot of fun. It's very cool. It's, it's, it's less of an in-depth look at all the science as much as a look at the inner workings of a fossil site and the museum and a lab and how does that process actually happen and what's the history of the site and the people who have worked there. Yeah, it's pretty cool to hear our buddies Sean and Brian chatting <laughs> Reminiscing. Uh, about their, their time in the site. So check that out if you're interested in that sort of stuff. It's a lot of fun. Well, that's the announcements. So Announcements, announcements, and announcements. As is tradition every episode, before we get to the main topic, we like to put the spotlight on a few pieces of recent news. So over to the news desk with Will. Will? I, I don't have papers to clack together on the desk. <laughs> it's a shuffle, shuffle, I, shuffle. Well, yeah, I'm ill-prepared. But scotch, scotch, scotch. I have my first news piece, and uh, completely unrelated to the poll, it's about an ancient croc. That's this, cheating. <laughs> this is out. This is this is the news. I can't control the news. Hang data. on, I got to go find I, a news piece about snakes. I just report it. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> <play months. laughs> 
this is this is a fun one. This is a news piece about a very early uh, cousin of Crocs that recently got named after being discovered decades before. This is Mandasukis Tanyauchen. Now, the research this is reporting on is by Richard Butler et al. in JVP, the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. And the article I'm reading is uh, from James uh, McNish and the National History Museum. And that is where the fossils were also kept in the collections, as we will see as we uh, unfold this story. So th this species, this specimen, a pseudosuchian, the very early ancestors and cousins of modern crocodilians, it's the beginning branch of that croc, that croc side of the archosaur family tree. It was discovered in the early 1930s in East Africa, in Tanzania, from the Manda beds, where you can see the name comes from eventually. A partial description was done in the 1950s by Alan Cherig, who proposed the name Mondasuchus as part of his PhD thesis. So, that, I mean, that's, that's a 20-year gap, but that's not ridiculous. Uh, he never finished that. He never came back to it after getting his PhD. He continued in paleontology, but never fully revisited this. Uh, imagine never going back and publishing your thesis study. <laughs> who, who, could, who could imagine? Who would, who would do that? That's, that's silly and irrelevant. <laughs> Later on, fairly recent, in the last uh, number of years, more expeditions have gone back to Tanzania and more specimens were found. And this kind of sparked things again. Uh, the older specimens were revisited in the Natural History Museum collections and a better, a more thorough description was given for this animal that's been sitting there now when it's finally gotten its name for 80 years. Wow. Yeah, so it took it a while to get a description. Uh, this is a decent-sized uh, reptile, about 10 feet long, 3 meters or so. And it would have been very early, early Mesozoic during the Triassic. We're looking at about 245 million years old. So oh, way back, way back. This is when archosaurs were really starting to rise up. So this is this is in those beginning days. And the the you know the fact that this finally got a name is cool. But the specimens that were also found recently have been revealing other cool things. The, these specimens, but others found there, are starting to help answer certain questions about early dinosaur evolution. So cool stuff going on in Tanzania. That's very exciting. It's always exciting to see studies from anything in the Triassic, really. Yes. Because especially earlier Triassic, it's much rarer in many places to find fossils from that age. And it's a very important time in the origins of the major archosaur groups. Absolutely. So if, if you're into archosaurs, you know. Yeah, yeah you know, if you're... Correct. Uh, <laughs> the uh, Paul Barrett uh, has a quote in the news article uh, emphasizing the importance of museum collections for things like this. The fact that these specimen, these, these fossils were found 80 years ago, but were perfectly protected and preserved until they could finally be fully described is really the, the key strength of having a good collection. And it's not just to keep these things looking pretty, but you may not be able to research something right away. Uh, one of the things, if you listen to A Touch of Grey, they talk about is that there are things on the shelf that may be there for years just because they don't have time to get to it right away, and it's not as high priority as the Mastodon skull that just came out. So Most definitely. The, it's, it's, a, it's a cool example of the museum workings and how it can really pay off. It sure is. My first bit of news, I just dug this up. Researchers have concluded that snakes are the coolest. <laughs> this is this is a study published in all the journals. Now, as one thing we would always like to remind you, one study does not... <laughs> <laughs> Touché, good sir. My first news article is about ground sloths and ichnology. Ichnology, of course, being the study of trace fossils. This is a study that if you're, it, you may have seen this going around because it was going around with a fantastic picture. Yes, it's got some good uh, art. A bit of artwork that was done for this study. A study by David Bustos et al. in Science Advances. And the article that I am referring to in this discussion is the uh, news report on the Atlantic by Ed Young. 
This is a series of sloth footprints, big ground sloth footprints, associated directly with human footprints. Ooh. These are discovered from White Sands National Monument in New Mexico. There are tons of tracks there. Mammoths and ground sloths and humans and all sorts of different creatures dating back to probably between 10 and 15,000 years old. So right at the end of the Ice Age, right at the end of the Pleistocene. What's really fascinating is that the sloth prints in one of the tracks of sloth, one of the trackways of sloth prints, the sloth footprints themselves are kidney shaped with claw marks is how they're described because <laughs> sloths walk very strangely yeah, like on their on, feet. On the, on the edges. It's... On the edges of their feet. But what really struck the authors about these footprints is that at least 10 cases of footprints in this track had human prints inside them. <laughs> and based on the geology of the footprints, there's no evidence of much time passing between the sloth stepping there and the person stepping there which seems to suggest that a person was following directly in the footsteps of this sloth. Wow. Which is weird because sloth, the sloth tracks are about a meter apart. <laughs> so this person had to have been stretching, like intentionally stepping in these tracks. And what supports the notion of these being contemporaneous, right? One of the big issues with footprints is that it's always really difficult to know, okay, were these actually at the same time or was this you know the next day or something yeah were these seconds apart hours apart days apart this sloth track and some other nearby sloth tracks react to the human tracks so in some cases the sloth tracks will change direction as they get near human tracks wow and in this case in this particular trackway at the end of the trackway there is a set of differently shaped prints that indicate the sloth pivoted in place and scraped its claws along the ground in what the authors are interpreting as a defensive posture threat display while another set of human footprints approaches from the other direction on tiptoe oh wow <laughs> the, now interpreting tracks is always very difficult Tracks are hard to read. To begin with, interpreting behavior from tracks can be very, very challenging. They make the case that this was two human, at least two humans, tracking and confronting a sloth. Now, they suggest that the most logical explanation, in their reckoning, is that this was hunting, which is sort of the most dramatic explanation that, that you could come up with. Although other people have weighed in and they're quoted in the article as pointing out there could be other explanations. They could be chasing it or they could just I, I like the, the 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 article in the paper used the phrase harassing. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Which makes it sound like they're just bothering a sloth. I have to say that was my first idea when I heard <laughs> the the human footprints were in the others, is that it was just someone going, huh, 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 and just hopping along. <laughs> Yeah. And in the article, uh, Ed Young, the reporter, says that he asked the main author if it could have just been a bunch of humans messing around. <laughs> and the author said they don't think so because a sloth is a big, dangerous animal, and that would be quite foolish. And Ed Young says, I see his point, but I also, he's, I don't have the quote in front of me, but he says, I think that underestimates yes. the, the, the foolishness of teenage humans <laughs> as a person who watched this watches the general public interact with animals yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so one way or another this is an absolutely fascinating case of human footprints and sloth footprints interact uh, showing an interaction between the, the different species possibly an antagonistic interaction possibly hunting any of which would be super cool this is this is a cool case on the face of it. That's a very interesting find to have potential interactions between two species, let alone one of them being our species. Yeah. That's not something you often get to have in footprints. But it's also very interesting just from a, a, a outside perspective of 
you always have those people in the movies or the shows, you know, the Sokka's that can go down and just look at some trails and be like, they fought here. He fell here, but then yes. someone <laughs> threw something and then they went that the way. The hobbits laid down here. Yes. <laughs> and I love this because one, it's close to that, which is cool, but also it shows how difficult interpreting stuff like that actually is. And especially when it's old. Absolutely. And and especially, you know, they, they mentioned that the tracks are actually extremely shallow and very difficult to read. They actually uh, detected them. They had to use a number of special techniques to detect the tracks, including aerial surveying and geophysical surveying. Wow. Just to pinpoint exactly where the tracks are. Very impressive. It's a really it's a really cool study. And our, our sloth buddy, now our best sloth friend, Dr. McAfee, also said that it's super cool. So we got another sloth researcher. Confirmed. <laughs> who agrees that it's confirmed. Cool study. <laughs> and, and the reports just end. Yeah, it, it's cool. Pretty neat. Pretty neat stuff. <laughs> say experts. Ex- experts say, wow, that's neat. <laughs> cool! Exclamation point. <laughs> to continue the, the human research train, uh, I have a news article about peoples, modern peoples, in fact, which I understand is weird. But yeah, that's, those are the most boring peoples. But these peoples are pretty cool. These okay. peoples know how to hold their breath real long time. This is research. Wow. <laughs> this is research done on the free diving Bajau people that are in the uh, Southeast Asian waters, able to you know dive down deep and hold their breath to forage and hunt. And findings have actually unveiled or revealed certain traits in their anatomy that make them better divers interesting yes so this is research done by melissa ilardo et al in cell and i'm I'm reading this in the conversation by written by melissa ilardo as i was saying the bajau people are a still uh many of them are nomadic in the southeast asian waters some have settled on the shore but even still, many of them continue this day to practice the traditional technique of hunting and gathering life off the reef almost purely through free diving, which is just diving without any breathing equipment. Free diving is just holding your breath, swimming down, and doing what you need to do under the water to catch food or gather resources and then coming back up. The only equipment they're typically using are simple goggles and weights. And they're spending a ton of time doing it. Like, this yes. isn't like a once a day thing. This no, is a they, lot of time. Their average work day, during just an average day of out on the water, they're spending 60% of it under the water. Wow. And they have a couple of records. The max depth that they have reached is 79 meters. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the unit I was expecting you to say. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't when I was reading it either. <laughs> and oh. they have held their breath for just over three minutes during their dives, which wow. that's that's extreme. That's ridiculous. But it's crucial to their survival. <gasps> yep. Yep. David will be our, our field test. <laughs> now, while they're doing these dives, the longer you can stay down, the more successful you are, the more you can do. So it's been directly beneficial to them to be able to dive for longer. To look into this, researchers looked at physical anatomy and genetics of the Bajau people and found a number of very interesting results. The first, most obvious one is, David's turning blue, is that they have larger spleens. Than... Oh my goodness, holding your breath is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> that Makes was like 30 seconds. <laughs> right? It's feel, And it feels so much longer when you're doing it. So three minutes is ridiculous. <laughs> these larger spleens, larger than at least compared to the surrounding villages uh, that are not diving, that have learned to farm or, or, you know, more relied on farming to survive, they have these, you know, proportionally larger spleens. And spleen is an organ that acts as a reservoir, a reserve area for red blood cells. And what it is able to do is pump out extra red blood cells during times of that extra oxygen is needed in the body that we need to be able to hold extra oxygen. So it basically raises your 
capacity, your holding capacity for oxygen in your bloodstream when it pumps out all these extra red blood cells. This has been seen in other diving animals like seals. So this is a trait known to be associated with diving. There also are traits in the genetics, which is, to me, extremely interesting. They found changes in a number of genes. The first big one is one that controls the hormone T4, and it's something produced in the thyroid gland. It can uh, increase the metabolic rate to be able to help combat low oxygen levels. So it, it can, in specific times when you're low on oxygen, it can kind of kick in and uh, adjust your metabolism to better suit those situations. That has also been seen in association with larger spleens in mice. So there's another connection there between th that first trait. There's been a, there, they saw a number of differences. The couple of other genetic ones that were interesting is they saw one that helps draw blood away from extraneous body parts like limbs and digits and brings it into the more crucial organs, the heart, the brain, and the lungs. Yeah, the core. Yeah, so it brings it out from what's not, you know, it's not as important if our fingers go without oxygen than it is of our brain. And another one that helps prevent buildup of CO2 in the body, which is what, what can cause that, that poisoning and can cause bad side effects. This, the really big takeaway from all these traits is that it suggests that the Bajau people have been affected by natural selection to be better divers. Yeah, they have evolved to adapt to that lifestyle. Yes, which is super interesting on the face of it, but also very interesting because it's often spoken of and considered that the human race has uh, taken itself out of the process of natural selection through our use of tools and habitats and housing and all of that stuff, that we're no longer really being affected by natural selection because we're not living in the environment like other animals would. But here's an example of some people who show evidence of being directly affected by their way of life and by the necessity to get better at it. This is really neat because it reminds me of similar findings for people who dwell high up in mountains. Yes, the Tibetan people. Yeah, it, t Tibet is, is a very famous example. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one of the things they brought up as a comparison is that the Tibetans, uh, people who live in those high altitude places, show traits that produce more red blood cells to combat low oxygen environments in those areas that Chinese people in the surrounding area do not share. Yes, and I I understand that, that those features have actually shown up in different regions. So you see them in Tibet very famously, but I'm pretty sure they've also been found in people who live high up in the Andes. Very interesting. And I think somewhere, I think some, I think maybe African mountains had it as well, that, the, that you see people adapting genetically yes. and physiologically to the place where they have settled, where they live, which is really, really fascinating to study. There's, there's also things that they've seen in people that don't have to do with being able to breathe better, but uh, the Inuits in Greenland have shown... Uh, anatomy that is better coped to taking on large amounts of fat that are in their diet, the blubber and things from animals that they're eating more of, and not have a heightened risk of heart disease. Interesting. And so there's there's multiple cases of this kind of process happening in humans. The cool thing that they point out, much as you were saying, is that the Tibetan people and high altitude people and the Bajau both have similar traits to combat low oxygen situations, one due to holding breath underwater, one due to high altitude, which both help fight something known as hypoxia, which is mm -hmm. a, a situation caused when tissue is deprived oxygen due to either injury or disease, but it causes tissue damage and is a serious side effect of long-term exposure to low oxygen. These traits combat that, the question they have that might be cause for future research is, are the Bajauan, you know, they, they cite directly the Tibetan people, are their genetic traits similar or are they different genetic solutions to the same problem? Oh. And by looking into this, we could better combat hypoxia in the general population. Fascinating stuff. It's so cool. <laughs> I was very excited to cover this one. That's really cool. There's a third part of that human evolution episode to be had just looking at human evolution in the last like 
5,000 years. Yeah, the trends we've been able to <laughs> document in the extreme minutia now that we've been keeping records. It's very cool. My final bit of news, bringing it full circle to our announcement at the beginning, is from the Gray Fossil Site. Oh. And it includes a group of animals that I do not think we have ever mentioned on the podcast before. No, because we haven't talked about the X-Men movies, so. Exactly. That's the, <laughs> we haven't talked about them. <laughs> Researchers at our favorite fossil site have discovered a fossil wolverine, a new species of wolverine. This is research published in Pier J by our buddies, Josh Samuels, Kayla Bredehoft, and Steve Wallace. Oh, hey, I know them. Yeah, those are fun people. The Wolverine is, not the X-Men, the Wolverine, the animal, is the largest living member of a group called the Mustelidae, which also includes weasels and ferrets and, and, and the like. All very ill-tempered animals. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and smelly. Yes. Today there is one species... Uh, that lives high up in the Arctic. Fossils are known from the Holocene, the last 10,000 years or so, and the Pleistocene in North America, Europe, and Asia. Always, you know, high up, typically high latitude locations. There is only one Pliocene record, that is to say earlier than the Pleistocene, which is a middle Pliocene gulo. Gulo is the genus of the wolverine. The modern day wolverine is gulo gulo. Gulo Gulo Island. There is a fossil of Gulo Minor from the Middle Pliocene of Russia. At the Gray Fossil Site, they discovered the oldest fossil wolverine on record. Since it is at the Gray Fossil Site, and the Gray Fossil Site's most recent age estimates are the very earliest Pliocene, between 4.5 and 5 million years ago, this is more than a million years older than the next oldest wolverine the one from russia wow what they found is a partial right upper jaw with two of the cheek teeth which are very very useful for identification what's really interesting about this about having a new species which they named gulo sudorus more on that in a second is that the gray fossil site is a warm site warm humid lots of forest adapted animals which is very different from what wolverines live in today Today, they are very famously Arctic animals. Since the Russia site, the slightly younger Russia site, is also a forest site, and there are other earlier records of wolverines from warmer climes, they suggest that the boreal habitat, the Arctic habitat, the cold climate habitat, might be something that wolverines only adapted to very recently. That this is a group of animals that started out in more temperate climates and have today become restricted and adapted to the cold. Very cool. The name Gulo Sidoris, the, the species name is from the Latin word for sweaty. Because <laughs> it's a warm weather, it's a warm climate Wolverine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I actually talked to Keela about this and she, they, she was very proud of that. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's a fantastic name. Uh, this is also, you'll remember from episode 14 that there's a lot of, the fauna at the gray site has a lot of Asian connections. Yes. Uh, this is another one of those, because the early members of this and closely related groups, such as Fishers, Martins, and the Terra, also are Asian North American groups. So having so this is another f find that fits into this pattern of an Asian North American connection at this time. And yeah, another thread between those two places. Indeed. Very cool. I like this, because as you were mentioning with the Asian connection, this also continues the trend of the gray fossil site just being not not weird in that it doesn't make sense but just full of bizarre surprises yes like finding a wolverine in a pretty not tropical but warm you know like florida kind of warmth yeah is a very weird unexpected find but cool I, what i really like about this and this just occurred to me is that we have found a fossil site where wolverines lived alongside red pandas yes and alligators. <laughs> yes. Like <laughs> what a cool place. <laughs> that's my that's my favorite thing whenever people are like, Oh, where'd you used to work before this? And I just mention the fossil site and they're like, Oh, what kind of stuff you find? And I go through the list and I start with the mundane stuff. They're like, Oh, we had fish and frogs and alligators and rhinos and elephants and red pandas. <laughs> and I watch them go, Whoa, wait, what what? Where are you digging again? And it's it's just this very it it, it would have looked so alien to have been there. It would look like a zoo exploded. 
Yes. <laughs> I want to see somebody draw a picture now of our Mastodon throwing one of the Wolverines. <laughs> fastball special. Early Pliocene fastball special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How else were they going to take down <laughs> the saber tooth that was there? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's perfect. <laughs> huh. Well, see, see, I, I, I started a joke and Will brought it home. That's teamwork. Well oh. done. There, there's with yeah, that. Finally, we have an X Men's reference. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> All the nerds are going to be super happy with that one. With that, we end the news and we move on to our main event: our discussion of ancient DNA here in just a moment. And now, let's talk about the absolutely fascinating field of paleogenetics. So, DNA, Dunna. deoxyribonucleic acid, is a molecule, a very long molecule, oftentimes, in our bodies, the bodies of living things, that is the blueprint for the body. DNA, direct, the structure of DNA directs the other molecules in the body, enzymes, proteins, amino acids, and so on, as to how to function, how to do the things they need to do for the body to grow and to develop and, and to, to perform all the functions it needs to. DNA is made up of nucleobases, the four famous nucleobases, ACTG, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and then uracil, if you're a completionist. So DNA, again, is sort of the blueprint of the body. So as you can imagine, studying the DNA of an organism can tell you quite a bit about that living thing. Ancient DNA is one of those things that sounds very science fiction. Yes. And not too long ago was thought to be science fiction. <laughs> For starts, a little bit of a definition. Ancient DNA, you know, we always think about ancient DNA being from, you know, the distant past. Yes. Mammoths and saber tooths and things like that. But ancient DNA is used to refer to just about any DNA from dead stuff. This can be things that are a decade or two old. Things in museums, collections are very, very often mined for ancient DNA. As far back, hundreds of years, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, and beyond. Ancient DNA is based upon the fairly recent realization that you can actually get viable, readable DNA out of dead bodies. So let's talk a little bit about the history of this. As I keep saying, it's very recent. The famous paper that showed that it was all possible came out in 1984, published by Russell Higuchi et al. This was a study that extracted DNA from dried flesh of a museum specimen of a quagga. A uh, quagga is an extinct uh, horse zebra type animal that went extinct in the late 1800s, 1883. So this is a specimen that was about 100 years old, and this study showed two things. One, they were able to show that the quagga was closely related to mountain zebras, which is cool, you know, scientific results, but also that, holy cow, you were able to read the DNA out of a thing that was dead for 100 years. I picture it being, being presented <laughs> very similar in that way, where they're like... By extracting DNA from this long dead quarrel, we found that they were related to these. And he starts going to this in depth thing of their relation. They're like, "Whoa, well, no, 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 go back. What was no, no. that first part? Back up. You <laughs> buried the lead. Oh, the DNA. Yes, we found in the collections. Anyway, the mountain zebra. <laughs> See, the way I would do it would be so by extracting the DNA from this museum specimen, we have shown that, my God, guys, we can do it. <laughs> this was followed very quickly by more similar studies. Across the 80s and into the 90s, people started extracting DNA from human remains, plants, dried skins and hair and bone in museum collections and from other uh, collected places. In 1991, the first international meeting on ancient DNA was held 
in Nottingham in the UK. This quickly became important in two very relevant fields of study, forensics. Forensic scientists were very excited to hear that you could get DNA from bone. That's a really useful finding. And population genetics. People who studied human genetics were, were able to now get DNA from another source. As time went on, we saw newer technologies, better advances in our ability to work with genetics and our ability to sequence DNA. Within more recent times, and if any of you follow ancient DNA studies, you may have heard of next generation sequencing, which is sort of the collection of all the best and brightest of the new technologies and techniques that have come out that allow us to work with DNA, to sequence DNA more quickly, more cheaply, and in greater quantities. So as time went on, as you go through the 90s into the 2000s, researchers start to be able to look at specimens that used to be too small. They say, oh, that's too small. You can't work with that. You're not going to be able to get anything out of that. Now we can do that. Now our technologies have allowed us to access specimens we couldn't before. Modern techniques, more modern techniques, also allow us to sequence more of the genome. Mm -hmm. You may be familiar with the Human Genome Project, which was a pioneering effort to sequence, that is to say, to basically lay out, to understand... To map. all. Yes, exactly, to map nearly the entirety of human DNA. Well, we can now do that with fossils. <laughs> yeah. A couple of milestones... About a decade ago, researchers drafted the complete mitochondrial DNA of a mammoth. Just a couple of years after that, the first ever genome sequence of an ancient human was published. This was a 4,000-year-old human remains from the Arctic. Wow. And between 2010 and 2013, researchers were able to sequence the full genome of other hominins, Neanderthals and Denisovans. Which is so cool. We have come a very long way in a very short time from the discovery that, wow, this is possible at all, to just 30 years later, full genome of Neanderthals. It it very much, the, the, the synonym that it brings to mind for me is like smartphones. The whole thing of wasn't a thing, wasn't a thing. As soon as it was a thing, it was everywhere and it's used as often as possible. Yeah. Because well, why wouldn't you? And that's a great comparison because this is also very much driven by technology. Yes. This is this is a field that has advanced along with the technology that has that that drives it. So, yeah, no, it makes perfect sense that it has really taken off. And vice versa, now that it's become so useful, it will drive the technology. We now know where we're lacking to be able to do more. And we can focus on those things. That's that's the cool thing about these kind of processes that put you know suddenly explode is as the technology better you can do, as the technology gets better you can do more. But as you do more, you start to realize where you need the technology to get better. Yes, and it it certainly helps that the technology that we're using to sequence ancient DNA is mostly the same technologies that we're using to work with modern DNA. Yes. And that's something that's driven by the medical field and by forensic science. So it's that there's a lot of push for that to begin with. And paleontologists get to sort of ride that wave with our ancient DNA studies. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about how the DNA ends up there in the first place. How does DNA preserve and where can we expect to find DNA? Because as you may have gathered from everywhere and from the way we talk about this, you can't get DNA from just any fossil. doesn't just grow on trees. Well, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't just grow in trees. <laughs> goes in the trees. Not every fossil has DNA, and not every fossil with DNA has a lot of DNA. If you recall the documentary in 1993 starring Mr. DNA. Yep, yep. Because it's so old, it's full of holes. <laughs> DNA breaks down. In fact, DNA breaks down extremely quickly. In life, when your cells are alive, DNA is constantly being attacked by stuff. It's being 
radiation can affect DNA, like ultraviolet radiation, your own enzymes. Your, there are enzymes in your body that are designed to break DNA. Yes. To help it replicate, to repair DNA. Damage comes to DNA from all different sources. But while your cells are alive, you have all sorts of mechanisms that are in place to fix it. That you, There are enzymes that repair any damage that is done to the DNA. Once the cell is dead, it's no longer being regulated, which means all that damage starts to build up. Once the cell is dead, what you have is DNA surrounded by enzymes whose job it is to break DNA <laughs> and being hit by all the stuff that would have hit it normally. And once decomposition starts, you've got microorganisms getting in there and digesting stuff. Yeah. And on top of that, DNA is a chemical that's not particularly stable over long terms. DNA will break down. Yeah, it's very complex. So, it, you know, even slight damage is going to be very noticeable. Yes. And, and it just spontaneously breaks. Mm -hmm. Hydrolysis and oxidation and deamination will just gradually happen to DNA over time. And all of these processes can be affected by the environment that the DNA is in. Humidity, temperature, salinity, pH can all affect how your DNA is preserving. The end result of this is that pretty much as soon as an organism dies, the DNA starts to break down. You do not find ancient DNA that is fully intact. No. I get the picture of the DNA in the cell after it's died. You're like, all right, we're dead. We can all take it easy, guys. Guys, enzymes, you can stop now. Enzymes! <laughs> enzymes! <laughs> enzymes! <laughs> <laughs> like scar at the end of the line. <laughs> <laughs> Fire flares. That being said, there are environments that are better for DNA preservation. Typically, the best, the first thing that most ancient DNA researchers will tell you is that cold and dry is best. Heat is bad for DNA preservation. Water is very bad for DNA preservation. Cold and dry is good, which is why so many people go searching in permafrost, which is frozen soil. Because if you're in the soil, you're not, you're not exposed to the light. It's cold, it's dry, it's also stable. It's not changing. It's not fluctuating. You have a stable condition. Certain caves can provide similar scenarios, similar conditions. Also, museum collections. <laughs> yes. Not all of them, but if you have a good museum collection that's maintaining the right conditions, those can be really good for preserving DNA. I mean, it, it and the cave have very similar uh, criteria. It's dry, undisturbed, stable temperatures, not yep. a lot of... of weird air flows going on so protected from decomposers yes yeah so that's where a lot of the best dna comes from in the fossil record that's not to say you can't get it elsewhere there was a there was a really interesting case from last year of a tortoise in the bahamas that researchers were able to get dna out of because it was preserved at the oxygen poor bottom of a sinkhole yes and that helped to protect it from decomposition, for example. So there, there are exceptions. That that tortoise made a a, a bit of a, a you know a bit of noise when it came out because people were freaking out over the fact of tropical DNA. Yes, not, is very rare, and so that was a big deal. There are also cases where, and this is something that I've had paleogeneticists repeat to me uh, mm -hmm. over and over. Just because a fossil is preserved well in one way doesn't also mean that it will preserve DNA. So it's tempting to think that, you know, a mummy, like human uh, natural mummies that are preserved in bogs and, and things like that, because they still have their skin and their muscle and their hair, you would think, okay, well, yeah, now you get DNA in that. But the sort of, in those cases, acidic preservation that is so good for preserving tissue actually destroys DNA. Very similar amber, right? Thinking to John Hammond in Jurassic Park and his yes. insect in amber. There was a study in 2013 that tried to get DNA from amber. Two specimens, one that was over 10,000 years old and one sub amber that was less than 60 years old. Wow. Both of them had stingless bees inside. 
so the researchers ground them up to search for DNA from stingless bees and found no DNA in either sample. Wow. They concluded that amber, while it's great for preserving tissues and stuff, is not a protected environment for DNA. It's a very counterintuitive concept. You think that if you've got skin and if you've got cells, you know, if you have tissue, you've got the cells of the tissue there, obviously. You should have the DNA in it, but, you know, you can you can destroy the inside of a cell and re maintain the the tissue very easily. They do that in a lot of museums when they replace the insides of cells with a, a plastic gelatin that basically hardens the specimen into a display, you know, a, a display item, and it, it empties out the cells, but you still have the tissue there, just not yes. the insides. Well, a very similar situation with embalming. Yes. When you embalm a body, which is another thing that museums often end up doing, and those make the specimens useless for DNA testing. Sterilizes them. In a lot them. of cases. Yep. So that's something else that has had to change in recent years is how we preserve specimens if we want them to be useful for DNA testing. That's Which is such a cool... I love the side effects. That's always very interesting to me. Where we realize we can get DNA from museum specimens. Oh, not all DNA, not all museum specimens. This, this, and this all destroyed the DNA. And you, I almost picture someone about to put something in balming fluid and going, "Wait, what?" <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wait, what about the quagga? Yeah. Let, let, let me let me find a freezer space. <laughs> that being said, in the right environments, you can get not only DNA preserved, but DNA extremely well preserved. I actually spoke for an article that I wrote a while back with a researcher named Vivian Sloan, who said that in a fossil that's preserved well enough, and if you can put enough technological effort into extracting the DNA, you can get a genome that is equal in quality to a lot of genomes we can get from modern specimens. Jeez. A very good idea of what the DNA was like of ancient creatures. That's impressive. Not only does DNA preserve differently in different environments, it also preserves differently in different parts of the body. One of the sort of general rules of DNA preservation is that denser bone is considered better for extracting DNA. So people will target the femur. Femur is a great choice. But if you look around ancient DNA studies, there is a type of bone called petrous bone that is all the rage. <laughs> It is bone. It's not its own bone. It's part of the temporal bone that houses the inner ear. And research has found that the petrous bone is fantastic at preserving DNA. It's like the, the holy grail of DNA preservation. So people talk about that bone all the time yeah. nowadays. DNA safe box. Yes, the black box of <laughs> DNA. But DNA can also preserve differently depending on what part of the cell you're in. Huh. Most notably... All eukaryotes have two different genomes. You have your nuclear DNA, which is in your nucleus, and you have your mitochondrial DNA. Think back to high school biology, the mitochondrion, the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, I, I, I could almost hear <laughs> people <laughs> listening along saying that. Yup. Uh, mitochondrion is an organelle that provides energy to the cell. It has its own genome for absolutely fascinating reasons. <laughs> it's really cool. And each of your cells can have several mitochondria, and each of your mitochondria can have many, many copies of its genome, which makes mitochondrial DNA a lot more common than nuclear DNA. Yes. So a lot of the time, you'll, especially the earlier studies, you'll see a lot of mitochondrial DNA studies instead of nuclear DNA studies. So your environment can affect your preservation, the part of the body, the part that what type of DNA you're looking for. But in the end you can absolutely get lots of wonderfully well-preserved DNA if you look in the right place. This brings up the question, the question on everybody's mind, the question that I find myself answering <laughs> the most, how long does DNA actually last? We have gotten confirmed, repeated, definite results of DNA hundreds of years, thousands of years, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of years in the past. In 
not too distant past, there were studies, especially in the 90s, that reported finding DNA in specimens that were millions of years old. Tens of millions, in one case even, at least one case, even hundreds of millions of years old findings of DNA. However, none of those studies of DNA over a million years old has yet to be reproduced. All of them have either failed to be reproduced, that is to say no one else could do it, or the same lab couldn't do it again, or it has been discovered that they were mistakes, that they were reading modern DNA or that they, they had gotten contamination in their specimen or something had messed up, given them a false result. To this day, the oldest DNA, the oldest reported confirmed DNA is a horse from the Canadian permafrost. Of course. Of course. Of which we have gotten a full genome, asterisk, nearly the full genome, that is about 700,000 years old. Which ain't bad. This is my least favorite part of telling people how old DNA can get, because this is, after you hear that, because that's, the reaction to that should be, holy cow, yeah. that's incredible. That's, I mean, that that's going back quite a ways. That is extremely old. That is about twice as old as Homo sapiens. <laughs> Yep, that's old, old DNA. But it's not as old as Michael Crichton wants it to be. <laughs> as soon as the million word doesn't come up, eh, yes. it starts to, starts to be a little more lackluster. Yes, it, it, it makes me sad that that number is always followed by a but. <laughs> but not 65 million? No, not 65. <laughs> Which then raises the question, is that as old as it could possibly get? And there was a study, there have been a few studies that have looked at this, but one of the more well-known recent studies was from Alan Toft et al., 2012. What they did was basically they wanted to see, okay, how fast does DNA actually break down? So they looked at a bunch of bone, MOA bones from New Zealand that ranged from a few hundred to several thousand years old, and they extracted DNA from them and Took, chose a few different sites that had very similar environments, similar preservation of their fossils in the DNA, to then say, okay, what is the pattern we're seeing? How quickly is this DNA breaking down? And that gave them an, a, a way to basically construct an equation, to construct a graph, to model how DNA breaks down over time. And what they found was that at ideal preservation temperature, which they noted at negative five degrees Celsius. Decent. Effectively, every bond in a DNA molecule is predicted to be destroyed naturally after almost seven million years. Okay. But enough bonds would have broken to make DNA unreadable after one to two million years. So that prediction... Assuming that they're, you know, and it, it, they're, this is one study, so it might not be spot on. But the best estimate that we have at the moment is that you're probably not going to get anything useful after a million years or so. Yeah, basically, by, by two million years and past that, it's broken down so much that you can't sequence it. And from there on, you'd be able to tell that it had DNA. But yes. <laughs> it'd be like finding a chip of bone, but not knowing what yes. type of bone it was or what animal it came from. You just, I found some bone. And publishing that that animal once had DNA is not not anything that's going to surprise people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, we hopefully we'll learn more about that, to, you know, looking at different environments of preservation and how different uh, circumstances can affect that rate of decay. But... Odds are we're not going to find DNA much older than a million years or so, if we're lucky. Yeah, the, the evidence is not pointing for us to... We should not expect to suddenly find even five million-year-old DNA, yes. let alone tens of millions. And this makes people very unhappy, because wah, wah. The, the only reason that ancient DNA is as popular in the public perception as it is, is because of Jurassic Park. This is very true. At least that this was the case in the 90s, when lots of labs started getting support to look for ancient DNA, because <laughs> it was very exciting, and it was in the movies. 
which is very cool. Just people coming down from the, the financial aid office going, hey, guys, I just saw this movie recently. I, I had an idea <laughs> for what, what your next project could be. Think you could do it? It's, it's you know, it's, what, how much do you need? And I've heard people when I and I've spoken to people about this who have said, well, w- we'll wait till the technology gets better. And there's a, a point to be made about, yeah, as technology gets better, we can work with smaller amounts. But as far as we can tell, this isn't a technology issue. This the DNA is just not there anymore. Yes, it, we would we would have to discover a a new preservation type, you know, some some other way that things have been preserved that preserve DNA to a degree we did not previously realize was possible or think was possible. You know? Yes. And even then, I'm not sure what kind of preservation would stop it from the natural decay that it undergoes. Stasis field. Yeah, basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so a little bit of history on DNA. We've been doing this for about 30 years. A little bit about how DNA preserves in the first place. Next up, we will talk a bit about once you have a fossil or a specimen with DNA in it, how do you get the DNA out? More on that in just a moment. So let's talk about the process, the procedure of studying ancient DNA. This is something that is difficult to understand unless you've done it. So I called up a friend, Leah, who you will recognize as one of the people who requested this subject. (laughs) (laughs) Our friend, Leah Lynch. Now, I have to mention that as of this recording, she is not Dr. Leah Lynch. But like a week after this episode comes out, she will officially be Dr. Leah Lynch. So close. So I called up our friend, Dr. Leah Lynch, (laughs) who studies ancient DNA, and basically asked her, how do you extract, you know, how does it work? How do you get your DNA out of your fossils? And she gave me a bit of the rundown of at least the way she does it. There's different techniques. So we'll, we'll go through a bit of the sort of a generalized understanding. We're not going to get into too much detail, but this, your mileage may vary depending on what lab you're in studying DNA. Yes. So Leah, a lot of what she studies, one of her main studies that she's working on is ancient Martins. Martins are another member of the Mustelids, the small weasel-like critters in the weasel family. So a lot of what she's working with tends to be bones and teeth, right? Stuff out of the fossil record and out of more recent specimens. But you can also work with hair. You can work with skin. You can work with muscle tissue if you have it. The procedure starts with reducing your specimen to something you can work with, which in the case of (laughs) bones and teeth means you grind it into powder. Yeah. Uh, This is one of the reasons that it can be a little bit limiting to work on DNA because not every museum wants to let you grind their bones into powder to make their bread. (laughs) And by bread, I mean money. (laughs) (laughs) Research funding. Research funding. (laughs) This is so one of the you... this is one of those areas where technology can really help cuz you know beforehand you had to grind decent amounts down to get enough to work with nowadays it's it's become less and less for a lot of these kind of things and Yes, very true. As that gets better and better you may only have to go scrape scrape. All right, now we can do our research which would be much more humane to the fossils themselves. Yes, that's also the case with things like uh radiometric dating. That that was my first but my my first thought when I was uh, learning about grinding up bones for DNA is that you used to have to, you know, for a lot of, especially for um, spectrometry, uh, spectrometry as well, you ha- you'd have to vaporize large amounts of, you know, whatever material you want to use to get a, get a spectrogram reading. And then nowadays it's just very small. Yes. Finer equipment. Yes. Better, better technologies, better equipment. Once you have your specimen ready to be treated, It goes through a bunch of chemical treatments. So you heat it, you cool it, you mix it with a number of whatever you want to use to adjust your DNA. One thing is uh, chemicals and molecules that will isolate the DNA to pull it away from all the other stuff that you're going to get in your specimen, all the other biomolecules, so that you can pull apart just the DNA. And then there's a number of other things you can add into this mixture. You can add in 
what's called what's known as barcodes and what those are are just unique sequences of dna that you will be able to read later that act as little label tags on your dna so the same way that every specimen in a museum gets a label this is number blah 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 blah, blah you can throw labels into your dna mixture and it will bind to the the fossil or the specimen DNA that you're looking for, and now it has a unique ge genetic signature that you can read later, so you know what specimen it came from. Which is so cool. And this allows you to mix your, you know, this allows you to work with multiple specimens at a time, without worrying about getting, for you know, get it, forgetting which one came from what mm -hmm. specimen. M much like you, you know, when we would work it with skeletons, you. As long as the label's with the skeleton, you can still work with... You can have them all out on the table. Yes. This is a taper toe or a peccary toe. Uh, let's find out. Yes. Another thing you can add in... This is really neat. Are baits. And baits are short sequences of RNA that bind to target DNA. So that is to say, if you're looking for mammoth DNA, you have specific sequences of RNA that will bind to the specific structure of mammoth DNA. And this is important, and we'll talk about this a little more later, because you're not just going to get mammoth DNA. <laughs> yes. The other thing this can let you do is target a specific section of the genome. So a lot of the time, researchers aren't studying the entire genome of their specimen, of their ancient or historical organism, because that's a ton of work. That's a bit of an undertaking. Yeah, billions of base pairs tons of time it's expensive so a lot of the time what they'll do is they'll target a specific gene or genetic sequence that is informative right a sequence that evolves quickly that we you can you can trace genetic lineages through or something like mitochondrial dna because you know you'll have a lot of it you'll know it's a little easier to work with so you can have baits that will bind, that will target the genes or sections of the genome that you're looking for. And now those can be worked with separately. Now those are labeled. Those have been identified. Now you can extract those on their own if you'd like. You can also do the opposite and introduce chemical filters that will pull out DNA you don't want. So actively separating the stuff you're looking for from the genetic material that you're not looking for. So there's all sorts of tr ways you can treat the DNA to chemically label it, isolate, separate out which ones you want and which ones you don't. So all sorts of fun uh, treatments you can provide to them. One of the very, very important ways to tr you have to treat your DNA is to amplify it. With, with respect. With respect. <laughs> it's it's waited a long time to meet you. Yes. <laughs> Amplifying DNA, basically you're just taking advantage of DNA's natural ability to replicate and copying it over and over and over and over again. This is something that medical professionals do when they're trying to study DNA. You are taking your tiny amount of genetic material and turning it into a lot of genetic material so that you can study it, so that you have more to work with. You can amplify specific sections of the DNA. So if you've baited your DNA, if you've chemically marked the DNA you want, you can target that for amplification. So you've selected what DNA you want, and now you've made lots and lots of copies of it. Now you have something you can work with. But along the way, before you get to sequencing, I want to mention one of the biggest challenges in working with ancient DNA is contamination. Yeah. You would think, at, at, at first thought, okay, I have a bone, I grind up the bone, I pull the DNA out of it, and now, oh, if it was a mammoth bone, I have mammoth DNA. But that's not true. You also have the DNA of whatever was crawling on the bone, mm -hmm. and whatever was crawling in the bone, <laughs> and whatever you let that bone get too close to. <laughs> also, were you wearing gloves? Because otherwise you're going to get your DNA, too. <laughs> <laughs> that was always my first thought once I learned a little bit more after watching Jurassic Park. It was like... Mosquitoes don't just drink from one animal. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't you have like two dozen different <laughs> sources yeah. of blood there and the mosquito? And this is a huge issue because as you'll, I've read over and over again, 
the majority of the DNA you get when you extract ancient DNA is not the DNA you're looking for. You'll get bacteria, you'll get plants and fungi and parasites. You oh, might get cool. DNA of the stuff that your animal ate. You're going to get DNA from whatever it's been around. So not only the stuff that was with it originally, but if it's been sitting in the soil, stuff lives in the soil. Anything that's alive, it's got DNA. And if you picked it up, if it's been around people, it, just about any fossil or specimen, any specimen you're testing for ancient DNA is going to test positive for human DNA. Yeah, it's just breathing too hard on it. Exactly. <laughs> so there's a lot of ways that, that researchers work to get around this. One of the ways is to avoid contaminating it further when they're working with it. Many labs will make repeated use of ancient DNA clean rooms. Uh, Leah explained that her work in clean rooms are rooms that have a fume hood, that have their own filtration system. She and the other researchers wear hazmat suits, the gloves and hair nets and facial masks to completely cover themselves up as much as possible. You're also doing the different steps, at least she is, doing the different steps in different rooms. So she explained that you'll do your DNA extraction in one room and your amplification in a different room. So you're constantly moving to avoid contaminating your specimen. Trying to keep as much quarantine, not just of the specimens, but even the individual process. Yes. That's, that's intense. In fact, I mentioned before I had spoken with Vivian Sloan and she's worked in sites, or at least she's worked with people who have done this in sites. I don't remember if she's did this specifically, where you're so... When, when you are excavating specifically to search for DNA, there are some sites where people will wear the hazmat suits in the site. Whew. And there's a picture. I wrote an article about ancient DNA for Earth Touch. And one of the pictures in the sites that she provided was a picture of a person in a cave <laughs> digging through the sediment in the full protective gear to prevent that contamination. <laughs> if, you, if you just came across <laughs> it, that'd be the freakiest thing. Like, well, well it's, it's like a movie. Yeah. <laughs> what you, happened in that cave? Are you here to get E.T.? <laughs> this is where this is where those dragons have been resting. <laughs> Other things that they that they'll do in the labs, Leah described that they will bleach the specimens in many cases, which clears off the external stuff. So microbes and things that have gone on the outside. That'll clear that off. There's all sorts of procedures in place to prevent cross contamination. That is one specimen mixing with another specimen. So she explained actually when we were talking that you'll have your different tubes with your DNA in them will have their own individual caps. And if you have to work with it, the way she said it was you open the tube, close the tube, wash your hands. <laughs> open the tube, close the tube, wash your hands. <laughs> and it reminded me of Rocco's Modern Life. <laughs> Turn the page, wash your hands. <laughs> So all sorts of different procedures to make sure you're not contaminating. And then this brings gets us back to the benefit of those filter systems and the baiting. So if you're looking for, if you have a bone and you, what, you know, this is a you know, Martin bone or this is a Wolverine bone or whatever, you can say, all right, well, I know what Wolverine DNA looks like. I have a Wolverine yes. over here. I can create RNA that targets that DNA. Go in there, find just the DNA I want, and pull it away from all the bacteria and virus and all that stuff. Just like studying modern physical anatomy to compare it to fossil specimens so that you can better recognize a snake from a croc, from a bird, from a, you know, whatever it is. It's cool that it also applies to DNA. You, any animal that's still alive, you can sequence their DNA if you just get a sample, and then you can work from there. And then... Once you have the DNA you want, you sequence it. And what this involves is basically reading the DNA. And the way they do this, at least the way that Leah does it, there may be other methods of doing it, but she uses fluorescent markers. So this right. is another chemical treatment that binds to the DNA you, to, that, that you'll have uh, uh, um, molecules that bind to the specific base pairs. The A, right? the T, Ad the C, adenine, the G. guanine, yep, ACTG. And each one comes with its own fluorescent marker. Then you put it in the sequencing machine, and the sequencing machine reads the fluorescence. 
So basically, it makes it a Christmas light chain. The color, absolutely. <laughs> so what what it cool. prints out is a list of colors. I don't know what the colors are. You know, green, blue, blue, green, blue, red, etc., yeah. etc. Then another program translates that into A, T, C, and G. That's very cool. And now you have a list, a digital documentation of here is your DNA sequence, and now now, now you can work with that. There is another thing that I want to mention that can often get in the way. I mentioned before, uh, Mr. DNA. Mr. DNA, <laughs> where did you come from? From your blood. It's not just that it's full of holes. DNA will actually degrade, and you can get damaged DNA, where the actual s f structure of the molecules has shifted. Yeah. And that can mess up how you read it. So there's all sorts of ways to account for working around damaged DNA. Make sure that hasn't gotten reorganized somehow. Yes. And then there is the question of what do you do with it when you're done? And this is the question of how you preserve DNA. In Leah's case, she explained that for DNA that they will be using again soon, like within the year, they'll put it in a freezer at minus 20 degrees Celsius. For DNA they want to preserve in the long term, they put it in a freezer at minus 80. Wow. This is our best procedure for preserving dna you make it really cold really dry really stable and hopefully it will last in there for as long as you need cryo storage yeah exactly that's exactly yes, what it, it is, is. Mm -hmm. that's cryo storage to keep it in place as long as you possibly can so we have extracted our dna we've read our dna now let's talk a bit about what we can actually do with ancient dna what can you do with the DNA you've extracted from your prehistoric creatures or your historical specimens or your ancient humans or whatever? So one of the really interesting things, now I'm going to go through a whole bunch of examples and a whole bunch, they, we could talk forever and ever and ever about cool DNA studies. We're going to do a quick breeze by of a few examples. One of the cool categories of information you can get from DNA is information about the individual you're looking at. For a really clear cut example, DNA can tell you the sex of your animal. And how cool is that? Something you can't typically get from a fossil. Very handy. Very, very cool. That's just X or Y chromosome or whatever that particular <laughs> organism's setup is. Yes. This is also useful if you have a, you know, so if you're looking for sexual dimorphism, if you have a species where the males and females are very different, DNA can tell you that you have the same species different sexes yes also hey remember last episode <laughs> where we talked about how age can be confusing in the fossil record sure dna can tell you that too if you've got a specimens of diff vastly different ages that you've mistaken for different species dna could help you resolve that you can even get extremely detailed information especially if you're working with familiar organisms you may have heard of let's see the ice man Mm -hmm. a desiccated mummy a uh, little over 5,000 years old from the Alps. There was a study that came out just not too long ago that, 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 that looked at Utzi's DNA and found that Utzi was lactose intolerant, <laughs> predisposed to cardiovascular disease, probably had brown eyes, and was infected with Lyme disease. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, if you're studying humans, I what that's the best organism to study because you know what to look for in your DNA markers. Uh, it's so well known. I guess to be more specific, he they all they found DNA from a bacterium that causes Lyme disease. Uh, Whether or not he was how much he was suffering from Lyme disease, I think is not entirely known. I don't want to overspeak, but one of the most useful benefits of ancient dna is the one that might be very straightforward and obvious is that identifying what you have absolutely now if you have a mystery bone identifying a mystery bone that you have no idea what it is is actually kind of hard using dna because then you don't know what dna you're looking for which means you actually have to shuffle through all of the dna that you get <laughs> which is uh, although you can target like mammal or reptile or you know, you, you can get it to, to certain categories. It could help narrow down. But in a lot of cases, DNA is very helpful for exploring the relationships of organisms you've identified, but you don't know quite where they fit. 
for a very recent example, just a few months ago, there was a study that came out that looked at the DNA of the stilt-legged horses of the Americas. These are an extinct group of horses that for a while, people from their morphology, from the bones, researchers had concluded that they were closely related to modern horse groups. Yes. This study of the DNA showed that not only were they not all that close to modern horse groups, but that they were different enough that these researchers gave them their own genus. And thus Harrington Hippus made the news a few months ago, a revelation of ancient DNA. Uh, around the same time, I guess a little earlier, there was also uh, the really weird South American mammal named Macrocania was identified where on the mammal family tree it and its relatives belong by looking at ancient DNA. A lot of ancient DNA studies are done on hominins because we tend to like those. <laughs> In fact, a, a case of revealed identity also happened with what is currently, last I checked, the oldest hominin DNA on record which comes from the Cima de los Huesos site in Spain. This is a genome that has been sequenced that is 430,000 years old. Wow. Which, once again, absolutely incredible. Wow. From specimens that, based on the skeleton, researchers had previously thought that they were probably related to Homo heidelbergensis. Remember our human evolution episode? We talked about the different species of Homo. But the DNA sequence particularly a study uh, just a couple of years ago that looked at mitochondrial and nuclear DNA found a close relationship to Neanderthals. DNA, if, if there's one thing that DNA has absolutely revolutionized, it is our understanding of our own evolutionary history. Yes. This is why you're able to do those awesome, you know, send in your DNA and they will tell you what countries your DNA comes from, but also how much Neanderthal you have yes. in your DNA. And so... <laughs> We're able to do that partially because of ancient DNA. And in fact, speaking of that, probably like the poster child for identification by DNA are the Denisovans. Yes. In 2008, a finger bone was discovered in a cave in Siberia, the cave known as Denisova Cave. In 2010, the DNA was sequenced because it was just a finger bone. And researchers said, all right, well, that's human or something very much like human. Could be human, could be Neanderthal, could be something. What is it? Let's sequence the DNA. And what they found was that the DNA was not Homo sapiens and was not Neanderthal and was not anything that we had ever found before. <laughs> to this day, this unique DNA signature has been discovered in three teeth and one finger bone. That is all we have of this unique population of ancient humans. <laughs> that are not Homo sapiens and not Neanderthals. They are known as the Denisovans. We know that they bred with Neanderthals. We know that we carry Denisovan DNA, but we don't know what they look like. <laughs> we don't know anything else about them. All we have is their DNA. What a cool find. That's very cool. It, th this sort of stuff, you know, seems incredible, but we do it with modern groups all the time of readjusting relationships and... Uh, I think we, we uh, do this in, you know, environments, environmental DNA surveys can pick up, you know, what animals are in the area by looking for DNA that's left just around in the, the habitat you're in, you know, stool samples, but also just on the ground that, you know, hair and stuff that's mixed in. So it's very cool that it also is applied to the past. It's with such resolution. Yes. And in fact, and I'm going to jump ahead in my notes a little bit because you brought it up. What you just explained of finding DNA just in the environment has also been done for ancient DNA. Nice. We mentioned in episode 30, the Coprolites episode, that you can get DNA out of poop, fossilized poop, Indeed. to study diet and ecology. But one of the reasons that I was speaking with Vivian Sloan for that article that I wrote was because she was part of a recent study just last year that was the first study to find hominin DNA human or human relative DNA in cave sediment. Wow. Not from fossils, but ancient human DNA in the dirt of the cave. So just like you were saying, where we do this with modern environments, you know, scoop up some water, scoop up some mm -hmm. dirt, what lives here, they've been finding very recently that you can do that with ancient DNA too. What used to live in this cave 
is preserved in the sediment of the cave. That's so fantastic. It's super. And in fact, they found it. That study found hominin DNA in Denisova Cave. Oh. Where the Denisovans came from, which is pretty exciting stuff. I will put links to all these things in the blog post, by the way. Lots of cool stuff. Ancient DNA has even been involved in legal cases. At least one legal case. Uh, if you are from, I mean, if you follow this sort of stuff, you may have heard of the Kennewick Man. Uh, or if you are in the Northwest United States, this is a human remains about 8,500 years old, discovered in the 90s in Washington state. That led to a big debate because these remains were found on federal land and fell under the ownership of the Army Corps of Engineers. Scientists looked at it and said, this doesn't look like any modern American populations. We, we want to research it. But local Native American tribes said, that's a Native American, and by law, we have the right to, to have those remains. And this became a whole big debate that was ultimately resolved when a DNA study, ancient DNA study, confirmed that, yeah, no, it's Native American. Wow. So the tribes got it back as the law, by law, they have the right to those remains. Absolutely. Another thing you can do is look at not just the individual or the relationships between groups of organisms, but how populations change over time. There was a study that came out uh, just a few months ago that looked at thylacines. Uh, the thylacines are Tasmanian tigers or Tasmanian wolves or Tasmanian whatever <laughs> placental mammal you want to call them. But they're marsupials. They were marsupials. Thylacines are now extinct, extinct since the 1930s. Very sadly, guess whose fault that is? But we have lots of museum specimens of them. And there was a study that looked at the DNA preserved in those museum specimens that was able to estimate the amount of uh, the population size based on the amount of genetic diversity in the genome. Very interesting. And you can not only estimate population size, but you can estimate a bit of the history of those populations. And what this study found was that population size in thylacines was in decline for millennia. Very interesting. So they were dropping, uh, maybe not on the way out, but they were declining for a long, long time before we got there and, you know, drove them to extinction. Yeah, they already were not doing exceedingly well. Yes. Or at least not as well as they had been in the past. Yes. Which, which is a trend that other animals have also been found that... Animals that were kind of falling on on rougher times then make their way out when they bump into us. Yes. So this has implications for conservation paleontology. It has implications for our understanding of recent extinctions. Another thing, and this is actually relates to Leah's research. I asked her about what sort of stuff she does. Is tracking, is basically looking at the different, different signals in evolution of traits. Yes. So to use the example of her research, she studies North American martens, again, little weasel-like creatures that go back several thousand years up to near the present. And one of the things that she's been doing is looking at how their limbs, the shape of their legs, differs across different ancient populations and what is causing that. So to use a simple example of how you can do that with genetics is you can say, okay, well, these are the different populations that have different limb shape. If that's based on their environment where they are, you should be able to see are, they, are the different limb shapes seen in the ones that are most closely related? Is that this lineage has this morphology, this lineage has this feature, or are they changing based on their local environment? in which case you won't see that same genetic signature. Are they adapting in quick time to yes. changes in their environmental conditions? Another thing, and this is super fascinating, and I won't go too deep into this because I don't fully understand it, is that you can look, and this is something she's been doing, is looking at your genetic variation in your populations in those that show those features to see how quickly those populations are evolving to show whether or not those features are the result of active selection or just random genetic change. Very interesting. 
So similar to what you were saying before with the human, the people who have actively been under natural selection pressure to evolve traits that help them to survive in their environment, in that news story, you can look at the genetic relatedness of different groups to see, all right, which of these lineages are evolving in a particular direction versus evolving just rag random variation. You can test you know, the rate and mode of evolution of different features. Very cool. There are a ton of other things you can do. Like I said, our own human history has been absolutely revolutionized by ancient DNA studies. You can study how populations have changed over time, study histories of migrations, relationships between different populations, what populations have interacted with each other. Are we breeding between these populations? Things like that. Population growth and decline, what people were eating, what organisms they were domesticating when certain <laughs> mutations <laughs> showed up. All sorts of fascinating things you can learn about our past. And then there is one more question that comes up with DNA. The big question, the question that everybody wants to ask. If you can get DNA from fossils, can you then use that DNA to bring extinct species back to life? Cookbook style. Like a cook, can you read the recipe in an ancient organism and make it yourself? Make it at home. <laughs> to which we hear very many hopefuls. Yes? Maybe? Yeah. The answer yeah. to that question will be discussed in detail in episode 35 of the Common Descent podcast. Aww. Where we talk about the fascinating subject of de-extinction. Yeah. Stay tuned for that. Spoilers, the answer is mostly no. But check out that episode, because <laughs> there's a lot more that goes into it than just that. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be our first five-minute episode. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, the extinction. Hey. Nope. Hello, Will. Hello, David. No. All right. Moving on. <laughs> Jeez, okay. <laughs> With that, our first ever next time on the Common Descent <laughs> podcast ending teaser, we will bring this episode to a close. Hopefully people have gained some new interest and appreciation Absolutely. for the study of ancient DNA. As always, we will flood the blog post with all sorts of different links and photos and links to places where you can see more photos. Check those out there. Next episode is episode 35. And as is our tradition that we declared 10 episodes ago, every 10 episodes... On an episode that ends in number five, we are on an extinction-related topic. And as I alluded to, next episode, we will be discussing the subject of de-extinction. Yeah. We're reversing the trend. We're talking about them coming back. In the meantime, thank you to you all for listening. Thank you to the person on the survey who requested this subject. Thank you to Leah for inspiring us, not only requesting this subject, but also talking with me about ancient DNA and helping me learn a lot about it. Big thanks to you. Congratulations on becoming a doctor. Woohoo! Check out the blog post on our WordPress blog where we will be adding links and the usual. As always, we are open to requests and feedback and comments and questions and concerns. Listen to the outro message for our various social media outlets if you don't know them already. As is always the case, and will be the case for the foreseeable future, we release new episodes every fortnight. Listen in two weeks from now for the discussion of whether or not we can bring ancient critters back to life. More on that then. It's I feel like the, the Rocky and Bullwinkle ending, it's like, will they reanimate a dead body, or will we all go home disappointed? Find out next time on The Common Descent. <laughs> <laughs> And now for something completely different. <laughs> Good night, everybody. See you, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. 
The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.